Up in the morning, good afternoon, and hello to planet Earth and to all the people out there in Sonoma County and, of course, the U.S. and everywhere in between. Um, you're listening to the Healthy Coach Radio Show, where science, spirituality, and self-discovery meet. Yes, indeed, they do. Some people say that the British and the Irish would never meet. Not true. Today, we're going to prove them wrong. Um, if you're listening on the radio, it's 92.5 FM. We are KOWS, and you can pick us up at KOWS.FM on the dial 92.FM. If you're in your car, or maybe you're flying around the universe in your unidentified flying object, or car maybe, if you're a Harry Potter. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Now this week, I have got a very special guest, and someone who I have gotten to know over the past few months. And just a wonderful, wonderful coach, author, businessman, and uh, all around just a, uh, uh, we're going to get into his, his, his the, the impact he has as a dad as well, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But our guest today, uh, please welcome, is David Foster. He is a master coach and author and inspirational speaker. And since 2012, David's helped a lot of ambitious business owners and coaches throughout the world create things like balance, clarity, freedom, so that they can really live an inspired life, a life that they love. His work specializes in helping people connect with their true purpose, get clarity on their plans, and make massive progress fast so that they can have a growing business, better relationships with their family, and enjoy the life that the universe has to offer. David has dedicated his life to being a present dad, that's a present parent, creating a loving family unit and inspiring people all over the world to connect with themselves and their families before it's too late. He lives in beautiful Essex with his wife, Trix, and their two sons, Rocco and Enzo. Please welcome to the show, Mr. David Foster. That was such a beautiful introduction, David. Thank you so much for that. And it's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. Oh, you're very well. And all true, David. I mean, I did not make up any of that. I just, uh, just want you to know that. <laughs> um, today, ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, the topic of our show is where's dad? And if you're in Ireland or Scotland, that would be where's me dad? We're going to be talking about his new book from the title, Where's Dad? And I'll, I'll just read the, uh, the, the subtitle here. Connect with yourself and your family before it's too late. Where's dad? David Foster. I love it. And uh, Mr. St I got to read what Steve Chandler says about your book because we, uh, we do enjoy Steve on the show. Where's dad shares wisdom that drops in at a deep, unforgettable level. I'll be recommending this to business owners, coaches, and parents, and probably anyone that I come across. Steve Chandler. Um, David, welcome to the show. Very honored to have you here. Thanks for your time today. What, the pleasure, uh, pleasure is all mine. Sorry, go ahead. What in, I'll tell you what, I'm going to start the show by reading a little excerpt from, from, from the book. Um, okay, cool. Nice way. And, and, and this kind of lays the foundation of what we're going to talk about today because uh, the crux of this book, for me at least, and we'll find out what, what, what from the writer what he, he actually <laughs> intended for the book, but is, is really the, the struggle of not only where's dad, but this could also be called where's ma'am. Mm. You know, it really could. Um, because we live in a world right now that, that we're, we're trying to live life at the speed of our thinking instead of the speed of life. And the speed of life is, 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 is a lot slower. And for men, and specifically in your book, Small Business Owner, uh, Ben, um, trying to do it all, trying to, trying to be a parent, trying to run a small business, trying to be a husband, trying to be a dad, trying to be successful, trying to have relationships with families, trying not to be fake in the world, trying to be authentic, looking at what I'm going to do with my life. I mean, you covered all of that in this book. And, and, and that I found very impressive, I have to say. I really did. Um, I also love, David, in your book that I love the relationship between Peter and Ben. Peter is the coach in this book that Ben uh, uh, gets to meet, luckily enough to meet. And as you know, dear listeners, myself and, and David are, are coaches. Um, 
and you outlined beautifully the relationship, the client relationship between the coach and the client and what that looks like. So, you know, for me, a lot of coaches are listening to the, to the show today. Um, and so I highly recommend this book coaches. If you're thinking, well, how do I get clients and how do I talk to people about coaching? You outlined that in this book as well, David. <laughs> so let's start, uh, let's start with a little excerpt and then that'll, that'll start our conversation. So this is chapter one, page one. Monday morning, I'd been in bed since 11 p.m., but couldn't sleep. My bedside clock read 1.15 a.m. I couldn't stop thinking about the business, about my family, and about money. We could probably stop there, but we'll go on. Each night I went to bed aiming to have a restful sleep, but then would start thinking about all the things and everything that was wrong with them. I'd forgotten what a great night's sleep felt like. I finally felt myself drifting off, but I'm not sure I'd even fallen asleep when I heard a little voice by my side. Daddy. Freddie, my two-year-old son, stood by the bed, holding his teddy. I checked my clock again. It was 2.13 a.m. I groaned, pretending I was asleep, and rolled over, away from him. I knew I shouldn't, but I hoped my wife would hear and take him back to bed. It worked. Come on, Freddie. Come and see Mommy. What is it tonight? Why are you out of your bed? I mumbled, thanks, babe. I need my sleep too, you know, Rebecca replied quietly. She returned Freddie to his bed and made her way back into ours, sighing as she turned away from me. It's not easy doing this when you're six months pregnant. I sighed back and tried to fall asleep. I was so tired. It should have been easy. Then it started again. My mind began whirring through all the things I needed to do the next day at work. There always seemed to be an endless list of my own tasks, plus everything involved in running a media agency. Nobody ever tells you what it actually takes to run and grow a business. Everything just keeps coming at you day after day. Staff to manage, calls to make, orders to track down, fires to put out. It all leads to a constant feeling of never being caught up and always being behind. And that was exactly what I was feeling as I lay in bed. Now that, that to me sums up the problem, David. <laughs> and we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at the solution. Um, but, but talk a little bit about that first passage. Because right? you, you, you just nailed what the problem was in that page. Well, thank you. And I'm actually looking for someone to narrate the audio book. And I think I might put you top of this stuff. That was, that was wonderful. <laughs> like, did um, I write that? That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, cool. Thank you. That's a, that's a really lovely experience. I've never had anyone read um, any of the book back to me. So mm. it, was, it was lovely to have that kind of wash over me. It was, it was a really cool experience. So thank you for nice. that. Um, so How do I explain the first chapter or the first couple of pages? Well, I, I've kind of lived that life. So I used to have several businesses and what happened there uh, wouldn't be out of the ordinary for me. Kind of laying in bed, feeling anxious, uh, my thinking overtaking my whole body, my feelings, uh, beset with worry about with all the loose ends, the things I hadn't done, all the agreements I'd broken, all the things I had to do that I hadn't even put on my list. And try to kind of juggle and balance that whilst being a, a husband as well um, and a soon-to-be parent at the time. So I kind of know the world um, of the, the small business owner um, pretty well, I would say, and, um, and also grew up in an entrepreneurial family. So I wanted to write, write a book that kind of spoke to that specifically because I think there's a lot of people out there that, uh, that think that they're alone with that kind of habitual thinking, those behaviors and actions, and I think there's something wrong with them. And I wanted to reassure them and say, hey, it's, it's actually pretty normal for this to be the situation, the life of a small business owner, because you are literally wearing so many hats at the same time as trying to put a, a brave face on, on life, you know. So now when I read that book, David, and, and I don't know you well enough, but, but is, that, is that book in essence about your journey or is it, is it, is it so fictitious that what did my what did my editor write? Hang on a second. What did he say? Tell me to write. I'll, I'll do my bit now. This is a work of fiction, and any resemblances to actual persons, living or dead, events, <laughs> places are purely coincidental and products of the author's imagination. So, 
Um, the, yeah, the book is a collection of, of life experiences from me, from being a child in a, you know, business owner's family and from working with no end of clients all over the world who would recount their stories and share their, their true life experience with me. So I, I try to get it as true to life as possible from a collection of those things, really. Yeah. So, because a lot of the, the, like, I could really relate to, to, to Ben. Ben is the character in, that I just read about who's sleeping in bed. You know, he's, he's married, uh, has a wife, a son, Freddie, and another, another baby on the way. His wife he is pregnant. Say. Um, and I could really connect with, with that story, not because I'm not married myself or kids, but um, I'm only an uncle about 29 times, but haven't, got, haven't gone down that Maybe 29. I know. <laughs> small Catholic family of seven in our family, <laughs> you know, very small. Um, but I could really relate to you because I myself have coached a lot of clients with similar stories to that. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I could really connect to it. Um, and, and I also, I also felt you in the story, I have to say now, and I don't know you well enough, but I, but I, but I felt you in the story. It's very interesting. Um, what do you want people to hear from the book, David? Like, let's, let's start at the end here. What, what do you really want people to hear from the book and, and who did you write the book for? Um, I, I wrote the book for, um, business owners for coaches and for parents so and there's there's several things i would i would love ideally for the book to kind of gift people at the end of it but everyone's going to have their own takeouts based on their view of the world really i would love for people to um slow down and say oh maybe there is another way to do this thing called life or business or parenting and to kind of give people permission to be themselves because throughout the the book without giving the kind of story away too much um, the lead character, Ben, realizes he's kind of living a, a life that isn't really authentic to him. And he's, he's kind of perennially uh, people-pleasing and finds it very hard to say no. And th through some coaching of, of his kind of uh, his mentor, uh, Peter, he kind of gives himself permission to be himself. And I think that's one of the biggest gifts you can give yourself to show up just as you and, and not try to be all things to all people. So... Um, and answer your question, give people hope, possibility, and also um, specifically for fathers is to encourage them to slow down and look at some of the, the simple joys and pleasures that parenthood can bring you. A lot of dads are so fixated in chasing conventional success, and rightly so in many cases, trying to provide for the family and pay the mortgage and pay the, the food bills and be the provider. And they wake up when they're much older and they're, they're full of remorse and regret having kind of not got as good a bond with their, their children. And they often, so I've been told, they go, I wish I'd have hung out more with my kids when they were younger. Mm -hmm. Because there's such a pureness and such a creative joy about hanging around with children that actually re-energize you in many respects. But if you're so preoccupied in the profit and loss of your business, your mind is moving too fast to even slow down to see that. So I really hope it helps people connect with their families. So the subtitle says it all really connect with yourself and your family before it's too late. That would be my ideal. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't get it back when it's gone. It's gone. You can't. It's gone. Can't. It's gone. I mean, it is. I, I know for me, you know, I didn't have a relationship with my old man. I left, I left Ireland when I was, 19 left home when i was 16 couldn't wait to get out and uh, a lot of years just being bitter and anger and working on my which is really funny because i spent so many years working on being successful so that i could show him hey look at how successful yeah, i am exactly I spoke to him <laughs> yeah we play this game with ourselves as men don't we i mean trying to trying to impress our our, our dad we do we do and, and I, I did that for many many years and yeah. um I don't think you ever, you ever sort of lose it really, you know, so it's, it just, it's very in degrees. And I, I want people to get the right impression from what I just said is this, this book isn't about trying to get people who are business owners to pack up work and, and be a stay at home dad, unless they really want to. Right. Um, but it's also about being really present and slowing down to connect heart to heart with the people that actually really matter to your life. 
yeah. you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes of pure presence on a daily basis with your child and your wife, actually, or your husband, if you're a woman, um, that quality time can make such a massive impact in the life of the other person and your own life, actually, and create a really, really tight bond. And I think people underestimate the power of that. So, Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they've done scientific studies with women um, and they found chemically in their brains that if when, you're, when your partner, your wife, your girlfriend comes home, let's throw the men out there, if you, can, if you can either pause what you're doing, if that, you know, if that works, um, and you can give her about 15 or 20 minutes of, of your attention when she first comes in the door, that is worth gold in terms of for the rest of the evening and for the whole weekend in terms of that, that connection. There's a chemical. I forget what the chemical is. Um, it, it, it's a connection chemical for women. Is it oxytocin or is it? No, it's not oxytocin. There's another name for it. Um, not, it's not dopamine? No, no, no. Um, uh, I'll, I'll think about it. I was reading it from, um, you know, the guy who, Gray, David Gray, who wrote, Men are from Mars, women are from, from Venus. I do, yeah, I do know him, yeah. Um, he talks about it in there. There's a, a specific chemical. They just found this chemical uh, like maybe five, ten years back. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's the connection chemical for, for women. So if you can give them your complete attention. But what most men do, myself included, is I give a little bit of, yeah, yeah, sweetie, I'll, I'll be there in a cup. How was your day? Wonderful, great. All right, well, we'll talk uh, a little bit later. Uh, yeah, you're good. All right, wonderful. Okay, that's great. <laughs> and yeah. we, so we, we, give, we, give, we give part time of ourselves, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. And I'm, I, I'm, I, don't I'm, think that's, I don't think that's exclusive just to women. I mean, it's, I think we all, we all have a, a yearning and a longing to be heard and seen actually love for who we are so you know i think it works both ways for me you know if, if my wife sits down and gives me you know pure presence and listens to me talk about my day or my, my current challenges for 10 15 20 minutes i feel such a deep connection to her and, and vice versa and it's something that if you think about how we spend our, our time during most days 10 15 20 minutes is nothing in the grand scheme of things but we can often skim over those things because we take people that we love for granted, children, husbands, wives, best friends, parents, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it, your book is where's dad, but as I said, it could be where's mom. Or it, could. it could be, it could be where's, where's anybody because we're, we live in such a fast paced world that even if we're not running a small business, it, it, if, if it's a, it's a mom, who's running a household, it's, just, it's the same thing. We're, we're, we're going at the speed of our thinking instead of the speed of life, and we're missing, we're missing out on things. Like I know for me, for years, I, I, I bust my chops to make money and be successful and have everything that I wanted. Mm. Um, but all the while, that's, that was my whole world. You know, there was, I, I allowed nothing else into that sphere of mm. building and creating and getting and all that kind of stuff, you know, and it's really easily done. Mm. I mean, I can sit on my computer in the office and, and before I know it, the, the day's done. And, yeah. and as you said in the book, I love the part where you said, you know, uh, uh, Ben was working all day long and then whatever was left of him, which wasn't very much he would come home and give that to his family. If at all, he gave that to his family, you know, and we, yeah. we, we, we do that. No question. Um, I want to pull us back to it a little bit. Something that you talked about in the book that I, that I really connected to, uh, and I'm sure the readers will as well. Uh, again, if you've just joined us, we're, 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 we're talking about where's dad connect with yourself and your family before it's too late with David Foster. Um, one of the things that I really loved in the book that, that, that Ben, the main character, one of the things that he struggled with was caretaking other people's feelings. You know, specifically it was his families, but also his wife's and, and everyone else and the people at work. Yes. And he, he dishonored himself a lot 
mm. and felt like he was fake a lot. Will you talk a little bit about that, David? How does that, how does that show up for people? And, and what kinds of questions can we ask ourselves in terms of noticing when we're doing that? That's a really, really um, great couple of questions there. And I think just from personal experience, um, you know, I, I found it very, very hard for many, many decades <laughs> uh, to say no, yeah. to say no and to actually ask for what I want because I, I had various uh, stories running that that was, that was bad or I would be judged or I would be wronged. Who knows what was going on in, the, in my noodle? <laughs> Who knows? Um, and I think in my experience, a lot of people kind of live that way, especially if they're, um, fearful of offending someone. Can you imagine the life of a small business owner where you've got, say, 10, 15, 20 staff on your team and, you know, you, you're already stretched thin and you're, you're trying to keep overheads down, but you know you can't really lose any more staff and you've got one or two people who aren't performing very, very well. You're in a bit of a dichotomy because one hand you want to kind of maybe get rid of them, maybe fire them or have a stern word. But the other hand, you're really, really worried about doing that because if, if you lose your team members, if they get up and walk, then you're, you're under more pressure. So you live in this land of, of people pleasing and caretaking and, and hoping that things are just going to resolve themselves. And that can happen in a relationship you know, with your husband or with your wife or with your friends. If you continue looking after other people's feelings, you're not, you're not filling your own cup up really. And that builds resentment, it builds anger that leaks out elsewhere. And a lot of people struggle with that. And, and there's a couple of really, really simple things that can help. And the first is just start to practice saying no. And what I, what I found is that I would feel the, the intuitive urge to say uh, no or no for now, or that sounds great, but I can't do it. <laughs> or feel the, something arising to try and say what I really felt to challenge someone back. Um, but I would suppress it. And just give a lot of half smile and say, well, that sounds fine. Let's do it. You know, <laughs> they, they, would, they, would, they would go, oh, that's great. And I'd, I'd go, oh, so that's good for you. Yeah. And they'd be happy. And I'd walk back and go, I've done it again. What is wrong with you? When are you going to that And I think we all do that to a degree. Oh, and for God's sake. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I'm and, laughing and, because I'm laughing because of the truth of that, you know? Yeah. I mean, we had a conversation before we started recording. It was, was similar. And, and it's something that I think people think is, is actually a bigger thing than it is. People are actually okay if they get a bit of gentle challenge or if you push back in a respectful, kind way and say, that sounds great, but I'm actually committed elsewhere or it's a no for now. Yeah. Um, but we put all this baggage in between us and saying the words and uh, it just paralyzes us. So one of the simple things you can do is, is slow it down and, and feel and kind of watch that intuition emerge if you're being asked something you really don't want to do and just practice saying no really politely in a really appreciative, kind way. And it will feel really edgy to start with. It feels nauseating. You feel like you're about to vomit. You feel like you're, you know, it's, that you're a bad person and how could you... But you know, two, three, four, five, ten times in a line, it gets easier and you bring a more more inner space, inner peace to yourself. And you're able to bring more of your authentic true self to everything you do then. It kind of gives an inner stability and inner confidence. You're you're less diluted in life and more the real you. Yeah. I, I love in the book that you you know, Peter Peter, who's the coach in the book, uh, yes. and Ben is the main character. Um I love how Peter worked with him in terms of, of that. So, so again, dear listeners, you know, if you're struggling with, with saying no, and trust me, wh what I do, my default is I, I say, I'll get back to you. <laughs> and then I go away and I have a think about it. And I, you know, I think I go, how, how am I going to put this? How am I going to say it? How am I going to say it in such a way that it's perfect and they'll love me forever. Exactly. And there's, yeah. there's no way, you know? Um, but I love how, how uh, Peter in the book asked him some very simple questions. You know, he said, uh, who do you want to be? What do you want to create? Because he was, he was telling, Ben was telling Peter, the coach, well, life happens to me and relationships, they just happen. Like, I don't, I don't do anything. They just happen. And, 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 and Ben and Peter said, well, is that true? 
do they just happen or do you create them? Talk to me a little bit about, about how you work with people who, um, who do you want to be and what do you want to create? Why, why is that important to ask ourselves, David? Well, I'll, I'll share a personal story. Yeah. Cause I think that's sometimes the most powerful and, and the, the most real. Um, many years ago, I was working with a brilliant coach, Joseph Shapiro, still coaching today, amazingly bright guy, very soulful, spiritual, and super bright. And uh, I, was, <laughs> I was in a coaching session, and, and I, was, I was Ben. I was sort of saying, well, you don't understand. You know, and I, was, I was a trainee coach at the time. You know, I'm trying to do this, but the, the guy I was speaking to, he's just not interested in coaching. He's a time waster. And that woman, she had no intention of buying coaching. And you know, she, was just a, she was lazy, and I was just judging all these people. And uh, talking about various things where I was coming across like a complete victim. And there was plenty of other examples. And he said, he said something really profound and really beautiful and simple. He said, David, he said, can I share something? I said, yeah, go. Ahead. He said, you're talking as if you don't have a choice in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And no one, yeah, and no one in my life, I was in my 30s at the time, no one in my life had ever said something like that to me in my life it's not the normal thing people say to you and it hit me between the eyes and i was like what do you mean even though i knew what i meant and he unpacked it and said do you not think it's about time to start taking responsibility for who you are in the world and what you want to create and the and the penny just the penny sort of dropped really mm -hmm. and because it had such a profound impact on me that's one of the things i always work with clients on helping them see that they do have the choice to choose how they show up in the world to choose how they be how they behave their way of being with themselves and other people if if they're open to living a, a created life versus a victim life and once you kind of make that choice it's much easier to understand well if that's the person i want to be and when i want to show up as what kind of actions does this person have how do they respond to someone when there are something they don't really want to do do they avoid it do they skirt it or do they do they face into it into their own inner resistance and say, that's a really nice thing to feed off of, but it's going to be a no for now, for example. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to try and give people a sense of that if they, um, if they were um, newish to coaching um, and to help raise awareness and also to, for coaches to kind of see sometimes some of the most simple things in a coaching relationship, the most simple questions can be the most profound and make the most difference in a person's life. So that was the reason for kind of putting that in the book and trying to unpack it in a, a simplish, simplish way, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. Um, because, you know, I'd often say to clients, um, why do you want to do that? You know, what, why is that important to you? It's such a simple question. Yeah. Why is it important? And, and it, it still surprises me today how many of my clients go, well, what do you mean? <laughs> they know what I mean, but you know, they're, they're doing what you just did. It was like, uh, uh, I don't really know what the coaches mean right now, <laughs> if, but I know. If I play mean. dumb, it'll go away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I said, well, well, why do you want to do that? That's a lot of time and energy and money. Why would you want to do something like that? Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's fascinating that they'll say to me things like, well, I don't have a choice term, but I have to do it. Mm. Or they'll say to me, well, that's just how, how the cards are dealt, Dermot. Like no ownership or responsibility taken in terms of, and, not, and I don't mean that in a negative judgmental way. I just mean it in, they don't see or, or are not aware that, that there's a choice in everything. Even not making a choice is a choice. Exactly. Yeah. You know, a choiceless Beautifully choice, said. as they call it. So I love that you outlined that in the book, you know, uh, uh, life happens to Ben versus Ben creating a life. And, and uh, there was a beautiful conversation uh, uh, in, in there. I think it was the second time he met. Um, here's a question I, I loved in the book, and maybe you could talk about it a bit. Um, I'm not sure whether it was the first or the second time they met, but he says, can you imagine the possibility of living your life as yourself? <laughs> now, I thought... What a beautiful question. 
Now, I've never asked a client that. I've asked variations of that. But can you imagine the possibility of living your life as yourself? Because he was, he was trying to be everyone to everyone, and he wasn't being himself, and he wasn't even aware. He, I mean, he felt that, hey, I'm being fake. But he, I don't think he really was aware of how much he was doing that until he, he met his coach and started talking to his coach. Talk to us a little bit about that question, David. Can you imagine the possibility of living your life as yourself? It's such a wonderful question. I will speak then and say, I just want to acknowledge you for doing your research. I've done a lot of interviews and podcasts about this book and you have done your research and I really <laughs> respect that. Am I? That thank is a, a level you. of professionalism that is really rare. So thank you. Thank you. You're very thank welcome, you. David. I, um, I, I appreciate hearing that. Yeah. So um, it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier on. I was mentioning earlier on about, you know, all anyone wants to be, to be is really love for who they, who they really are. And often people, people don't ever realize they're not being themselves. They kind of, they've got into some habitual pattern and behaviors and actions that they think are serving them on some level. And um, even though there is an intuitive whisper, that there's another way to do this thing called life. There's another way to show up in the world. They might have secret dreams or ambitions or, things they've always wanted to to do or th things they always wanted to say to people, but they always kind of bury that. And I wanted to get across them, but with that particular question, that's why I use my clients quite a lot, is just to explore the possibility of whether, whether people are truly being who they want to be in the world and showing up authentically. And, and once again, this, this comes from my own kind of experience of, of, being coached, I um, I always thought I had to be someone else to get along in the world, to put on a certain persona, a certain mask, to behave in a certain way, to get attention or to get laughs or to get accepted or to get love. And that was a modus operandi, a normal way of operating for me. And I didn't think there was another way of really being until I got coached. And I, I was slowed down in one of my very first sessions and asked a series of questions around being and doing and goals and values. And I was like, where, where have these questions been all my life? You mean I can just, I can actually ask for what I want. I can be who I want to be and that will be okay in the world. And kind of that started the journey of me giving myself permission to be myself. And it, because it had such a lovely, profound, heart opening, empowering effect on me over many years, I wanted to try and find a way of, of gifting that to the reader in some way, shape or form. So they, they have a level of curiosity inside themselves. If, if that's, if they're showing up in a way that they feel is a little bit fake or inauthentic to kind of explore what does, what does bringing more of the real me to my life look like mm -hmm. and to be, just be, be myself or be yourself and show up that way. That was my kind of wish for that particular excerpt in the book. Yeah, no, that, that really does, David. I, I appreciate that. You know, when I look at that question, can you imagine the possibility of living your life better? Can you imagine the possibility of having a better relationship? Can you imagine the possibility of having a better life? I mean, it's such a beautiful question. And, and, and you, could just, you could ripple that question and just, instead of yourself, put in life, relationships, finances, I mean, the list is endless. It's a great question to, 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 for people to, I think, consider. So we, we, we want to we ask the listeners to ponder that question. Um, one of the things in the book I loved was um, that Peter would, would often ask Ben, his client, to just sit on the weekend, you know, and have a cup of tea or whatever, and just reflect reflect on the questions, reflect on the conversations. Now, we're not saying, listeners, that you need to have a coach in order for your life to get better, because, because you don't. Um, you could certainly read David's book and your life would get better, because <laughs> there's some great questions in it. Um, but we're not, we're not saying that, David, are we? Maybe we are. <laughs> oh, do you know, it's a bit like asking a hairdresser if you need a haircut I'm, I'm a coach so I'm, I'm a big advocate of coaching so I, right, I right. think that I would always um 
encourage people to explore the possibility of, of speaking yeah. to a coach, but no, you, you don't, you don't, there's, there's, you know, 7.8 billion people in the world and billions of those don't have coaches and are doing fine. Um, but if, if there's, if there's a, you know, a desire in you to, to explore um, what life could look like if it was different for you um, and you have a interest in personal transformation and getting to a, a higher level in some part of your life or even more empowerment in a certain area of your life, then coaching is definitely a viable option to explore. And there are, there are some amazing coaches out there. I mean, oh, me yeah. and you know a lot of great coaches. So you don't need one, but I think it probably helps. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're honored to know a few good ones. That's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, share a story with us, David, um, something from your archives um, in terms of, of working with men in, that run small businesses and are, are, are close to, to, to the character in your book, Ben. Share a little bit of like, what are some things that you guys talk about? What are some questions that you, that you ask people to kind of help them open up a bit and, and look at a bigger picture here? Let me think, think of a couple of client stories to illustrate the point. So um, I used to work for a franchise coaching organization uh, called Emith. And uh, it's an amazing book, The E-Myth Revisited. I think it's called Why Most Small Businesses Fail and What to Do About wonderful, It or something. Like wonderful, that. wonderful. Uh, and there's some really cool hidden messages inside that book, one of which is you know, being really connected to, your, they call it your primary aim, which is your, your main purpose in life. But the one that most people take away is that as business owners, if I put systems in my business, I can be free of the business franchise the business and go and live a life I really want to live. And I used to find people would come to me and say, I just want systems. And I'd say, well, why? Well, because my business is a grind. I don't like it. I hate it. I'm working really hard. And I think there's a lot of people out there. The reason I share this is because there's a lot of people out there, I think, who have started a business in a field that they are technically gifted in. They might be a great carpenter so they start a carpentry or building contract business or they may they may be good at selling advertising so they start a media agency right right yeah and, and they have the shock of their lives because the the distinction between being technically good at something and actually running a business is night and day and you bring into like management of staff and teams and finances and profit and loss accounts and paying tax and self-organization time management selling to people paying bills suppliers it's a never end. It's a plethora of different things you have to do. And I think there's a lot of people out there who, who kind of chase what I call conventional success in order to feel whole inside themselves. I had, a, for me personally, I had a dream of if I, if I break a million in my, in my business, then I'm going to be seen as someone. Mm-hmm. Well, I've Mom. kind of had the same dream, David. Yeah. yeah. I was always trying to break a million. I wanted to be a millionaire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, me too. And, you know, I had, I had a joke with my mum that when I was 30, I was going to buy her a Mercedes soft top car and I was going to be a millionaire. And Yeah, yeah. Why, why, because I was running stories about, you know, you know, I needed to get dad's approval. Then dad would see me as a businessman like him and mm. all these sort of things. And a lot of people, I think, have similar sort of things running in the background when they're, they're kind of chasing, chasing, chasing something on the outside of themselves thinking that it's going to solve an inner conflict they've kind of got. We're actually, their heart's desire is maybe calling them to go a different path, but they feel they can't because they need to be successful or make money or do this and that. So a lot of business owners end up like the guys that would come to me saying, I just want systems because they've created this business that surrounds them that is actually bigger than their life. When actually a business should sit inside your life as a fulfilling part and really serve your life. And that was the desire people wanted systems because they wanted to get rid of this thing that was controlling them. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you, if you slow it right down and, and really identify with what it is that truly drives your intrinsic values from the inside out and connect with your true purpose, which is something I do with every single client and create a business or a profession or a vocation from that place, as we're probably both doing, I can't um, talk for you, but I know I, know I am. You know, it's a very different flavor. It's a very different vibe and a very different experience of life. You may not have seven, eight figures on the bank statements or on your revenue statements, but we're not here 
to, to build a massive bank balance. We're here, I think, to experience all that life has to offer and to do the, do the best we can while we're here. And if you think about um, the responsibility of parents and the next generation, I, for one, don't want my children to grow up thinking they have to go to work or into a business that they hate just to make money. Yeah. I want them to do something they love and realize it's okay to do something you love and get paid in a really healthy way for it and experience all that life has to offer. Yeah, so I I, I get it. I, uh, you know, what what comes to me when I hear you talk about that, David, um, I I spent, I don't know how many years I spent trying to, trying to fix feelings by buying stuff. Yeah. You know, trying to fix my, I'm not good enough. I don't have it. I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm not worthy. Blah, blah. blah. Trying to fix feelings by buying more stuff. And, and, and it's kind of cool in the way that I got all the stuff because then I realized, realized that, that the stuff is not going to fix the feelings. (laughs) You're you're spot on. You're spot on. So happy are those who get what they want because then they can see that they don't need it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, I've had it both. I've I've had uh, you know big big success and massive failure, and lucrative windfalls, and then you know lost loads of money and stuff. And I think it takes those sort of elements in life to go. What's really important to me? Yeah. Who? Back to the question: Who do I really want to be in this world? What difference do I want to really make? And, and it's okay to have both. Like, like it is. I want to be the advocate for the listeners here. It's okay to make a buttload of money. Totally. And have a great life. It's, I mean, you, you, you can do that. Now, I, like you, David, came to the realization after a lot of pain and suffering. Um, when I was 30, my life just completely fell apart. And, um, and then I started looking into things like self-development, spirituality, yoga, meditation, you know, all sorts of stuff. I was in LA, so it was like I was a kid in a candy store. I just I went nuts with all the self development stuff. It was, it was a wonderful time. It was really wonderful. Um, but I came to the same conclusion that it's something my mother said to me a long time ago. You alone can do it, but you can't do it alone. Mm. And 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 see, that's where I think coaching really comes in. It mm. really for me, coaching was a whole. You know, I, I, uh, it was, you were talking about, you know, sometimes we have these hobbies and not every hobby you have to make into a business. You can actually have the hobby. Yeah. <laughs> so I love what you said earlier because like, that's what we do. We're like, oh, you know, I'm kind of good at this coaching thing a little bit. I think I'm going to leave my job and I'm going to become a coach. And then reality hits and it's like oh wait a minute i have to manage my time i have to manage people i have to manage my money i have to get on track i have to look at client cultivation I, you know all this stuff and it's like holy moly yeah um and so i think when i when i truly got and again when, i'm not saying that people need to get coaching however I, i'm like you david i'm a huge advocate for coaching because i i, I know the value of it because I've, I've i've had it in my life yeah. but i didn't really I didn't really get serious about my life till my life fell apart. And then I started looking at, you know, I was not, I'm not a person used to be that would be saying, you know, I need help. That was not on my, you know, and, and, and the character in your book was the same way. Ben was not some, even though he knew his whole life was falling apart, even in his first session, with his coach, the coach says, well, how's it going, Ben? And he says, oh, good, good, things are good. You know, I got a few things to work on like most people, but mostly things are good. <laughs> and we do that to ourselves. We, be, we BS ourselves until, you know, the poo really hits the fan. And then it's like, oh, I, I need help. Um, did you have a moment, David, where you were like, I, I need help, I'm, I, this ain't happening? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. But I want to just echo um, something you, you said a few minutes ago um, for the listeners out there who who have, you know, have businesses or who, who are really chasing success and they love that. There is nothing wrong with having a really high value and like a priority on making money. 
if it really drives you. Um, for me personally, uh, and the character Ben, he's chasing that dream of being successful, making money, but he's doing it for the wrong reasons. He's not being himself. And the, the book the book kind of evolves and shares that story. So there's nothing wrong with it if it's high on your list of values. For me, you know, family is, is probably more important in many respects. Um, for me, yeah, um, many moments in life where I perceived that life was falling around, falling down around me. Um, the one that springs to mind was when I, it was two weeks before the the birth of my first son. And the context is here, we'd, we'd tried for a child for, for four years. I think we had four miscarriages in oh, wow. four years. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, looking back, it was, it, it's pretty normal now. Now I understand more about how conception happens on a biological level you know it's if if there's something not quite right then uh the mother rejects it right or the egg rejects it so um but at the time it was it was horrendous and we eventually fell pregnant and it was a very nerve-wracking pregnancy because i was in the throes of a business that i didn't want to be in in a business partnership that was i didn't want to be in i was uh blaming everyone else for my, for my own shortcomings and not owning the fact that i'd co-created this business that was costing loads of money having had great success and two weeks before my first son was born um, I was sitting in a hotel with a a liquidator to liquidate the company and the business had loans against it that were guaranteed to my house so imagine this so you know wife two weeks away from having a baby and I'm signing papers that could mean we lose our house and I knew that I, I had to find a way of reinventing myself in some way, shape or form. And my first son came along and it was a seminal moment. Uh, I held in my arms, his eyes like mine. And uh, it's really hard to explain it. It's, it's just a, I can't put words around it. But I said to myself, I'm done. And I said to him, I'm done. I'm done yeah. with this. I didn't know what that looked like. Right. He probably looked. He probably looked at you with those cosmic eyes, David, and, and said, "David, get your act together." He, he literally did, and oh, my heart opened. It burst open. I was like, "Okay, I'm, I'm done." Wow. And the next day, I emailed my business partner and said, uh, "We've been on this journey, but I've I've had an epiphany. I'm I'm done." And I, I spent eleven months working myself out of that business, and and you know, at the the new business we created, and walked away with nothing. And I just knew I wanted to use my experiences to make a difference in the world, to help people, to not go through what I went through the last two or three years of that business. And then I discovered this thing called coaching. I was like, where the hell has this thing been hiding? Because I'd, I'd ended up over the years paying thousands, tens of thousands to consultants, experts, mm-hmm. who would come in and do, do okay work. But once they went, nothing would really change. Yeah. But coaching is really about flicking those internal switches and that real deep level of transformation in some cases. So when the coach leaves the relationship, the person's on a completely different course with their life and fully empowered. Yeah. And I, lo- I love the, the flavor of that and wanted to dedicate my life um, to helping share that with the world, really. Yeah, the, the, you know, I think one of the things that surprised me when I first got into coaching, because I thought coaching was about, all right, you coach the person, you meet them a couple of times a month, you coach them and that's it. But it, it, it's really, it's really a relationship. So you're not, mm. you're not, you know, like I often tell coaches, and you and I both train coaches to build their business. We do, yeah. Uh, and one of the things I often tell them is, look, this is like, it's like you having a new relationship with with a new boyfriend or girlfriend. It's a relationship, and so you don't have, you're not meeting the client twice a month, and that's it. It's a relationship. They've got, they've got somebody that's going to be your partner, that's going to be your voice, that's going to be your friend, that's going to give you a kick up the arse when you need it Mm. for whatever that length of time is. And and I think that's so, and that's different than consultancy and, 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 and a lot of those different modalities because you really have somebody who's going to help you just stay the course, stay, stay on track and not only stay on track, but make that track be fun. You know, and, 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 and in all of that, find out who you truly are. You know, as Oscar Wilde says, be yourself because everyone else is taken. <laughs> my, my, my I love favorite. that quote. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, there's, 
there's 30 million small businesses in America. Mm. And 60% of those businesses are run by, by males, by men. Mm. Um, so, men, read this book. It's <laughs> going to be very helpful for you. All, all whatever, whatever, whatever 60% of 30 million is, read it. <laughs> um, David, uh, I, I want to start kind of bringing us here to the to the end of your book, and 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 I won't give away the ending, um, but let's just say I read your book in a weekend. My my girlfriend was like, "What are you doing?" Uh, I just read a couple more pages. Well, we're going out for a walk. I will just two more pages. All right, we'll sit down and have a cup of tea. Well, hang on, I'm going to read a few pages here before we. And I finished your book in, in, over the weekend. It, it, it's oh, that's great. You know, it, it, it just, it was like a really good cup of tea. That, that's how, I, that's how I, I, I experienced your book. And, and I liked that, I liked that you, that it's a self-development book. It's a self-help book. But it's done in a way that is not, okay, if you want your life to be better, ask yourself this question. And then ask yourself that question and then get a strategy and a system and a structure and prioritize this, this, and this. I really like that you, you laid it into a story that, that I think mams, dads, uncles, brothers, sisters, if there are some sheep out there that can read, um, <laughs> would really relate to, you know, it was very relatable, uh, uh the book on, on so many levels. Um, can I can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. And thank you for that lovely, lovely. Fine, endorsement. somebody interviews me. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm going to do it. Don't worry. Take it away. It. Well, you um, you're really good at interviewing too. You you've done a lot of interviews over the years yourself. I, it takes right. my own. But, um, firstly, I might I might change the Steve Chalmers endorsement to Dermot's endorsement. The front <laughs> cover. It's like a really good cup of tea. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Um, so what? If you can pinpoint like one one takeaway that you got from the book that, that like made an impact for you when you read it, what would that one takeaway be? Well, there was a few. One of the one of the one of the things that really stood out to me was that I'm responsible for the choices that I make. I'm responsible mm. for being Dermot. You know, I'm responsible for the negative and the positive. Uh, that really stood out to me. Um, let me reflect on that for a second, David, so I can I give you a, maybe maybe a, a, a better answer. I'll tell you that really stood out to me was was the relationship Ben had with his father. Now, my father was not a workaholic. He was an alcoholic. Hmm. But a lot like Ben's father, he was never around. And, and there's a scene in the book where Peter has told him, you might want to call your father, you know, and just have a little kind of a heart to heart instead of the BS that they, that they usually had, which is how I, if I ever called my father, it would be, uh, how's the weather in Ireland? Oh, good, great, great. All right, well, let me speak to mom. And that's how those conversations went. So I really, um, I, I really connected to that. And, and similarly, I won't give anything away in the book, but I had my own experience of, of Ben with his father as their relationship got a little bit better, as he started to take responsibility for the yes. relationship. Uh, that's a better way of saying it. Um, I had that relationship with my father before he died. I was able to go home. I had, I had, you know, I had forgiven him and I'd forgiven myself and I was no more angry, this, this angry 20, 30 year old. Um, and I was able to go home and, and have that relationship with my father for a couple of days. And, and I really connected to that part in the book actually. And, and, and it's interesting. It's not a huge part of the book. I didn't experience it as a huge part. But um, for me, it was very meaningful. Yeah. I love that. Thanks. Thank you for sharing Thanks that. Question. No, I love that. And uh, it, it is actually, you've, you've done a beautiful job there of, of reading between the lines. 
because uh, that is that is actually a huge part of the book, but it's very subtle in the yeah. book. So, so well done. Yeah, yeah, I I I, I felt that. Um, David, do me a favor, just as we close. I could talk to you all day, but again, oh, if you just joined the show, everyone, you've missed it. Um, but we're talking to <laughs> <laughs> we're talking to David Foster about his new book, Where's Dad? Connect with yourself and your family before it's too late. Beautiful, beautiful uh, book. And, and again, it could be Where's Mam? Connect with yourself and your family before it's too late. Um, take everything that we talked about today. Uh, no pressure, but take everything that we talked about today, David. Um, what do you want the listeners to walk away with from our conversation? either from our conversation or, or what would you like them to walk away with uh, uh, from your book? Actually, let's do both from the conversation today and from the book, just to put the pressure on you. So what would I like the listeners to walk away with from the conversation today? Yeah. Uh, curiosity. And from the book, I think I'll just share the Oscar Wilde quote, which is, be yourself, everyone else is taken. Beautiful. And, and, and what about, was, that, was that for the show or for the book? They kind of interlap like a little Venn yeah. diagram. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. I, I should know. You, professionals, they can easily just take both and beautiful. David, thank you very much, sir, for your time today. It was an absolute pleasure. I really appreciated getting to know you a little bit more, too, over the course of our talks before the show. And, uh, and thanks for writing the book. Uh, it, it, it's a lot of, as Steve says, time and energy. And it, it's a, it's a, I know because I'm doing it myself right now. And it's a, it's a labor of love. So, yeah, so I really appreciate that you that you – you took the time to write the book. So thank you very much for that. And to all the listeners out there, again, where can they pick up the book, David? Is it on Amazon? Or one it's of on Amazon. Yes, it's on Amazon globally. So Amazon.com if you're in the States or .co.uk if you're in, in the UK or whatever the, <coughs> the URL is in your, your um, relevant country. And um, there's actually, if people are curious and they want to download uh, five sample chapters, they can actually go to my website, which is, is really simple it's davidfoster.coach slash book or even just davidfoster.coach on the home page and they can click a button on there and and take literally the first five chapters in the, in the front cover uh, and yeah have, have a little taste of the book there if, if it calls them and if not that's okay too and it's been an absolute pleasure and joy to to sink in a bit deeper with you and i really appreciate what you're up to in the world love your show uh love what you do with your coaching practice and the way you inspire many many people and it's been a real pleasure to be here so thank you yeah thank you very much david appreciate that uh where's dad connect with yourself and your family before it's too late david foster f-o-s-t-e-e-r or you can go to davidfoster.coach all right ladies and gentlemen and uh you've been listening to the celtic coach where science spirituality and self-discovery meet if you're on the radio, you'll pick us up at Cows at 92.5 FM on the dial. And if you want to go to the website to listen to the show live, you can go to kows.fm. But we'll also throw it up on all those other social media sites that I'm not going to give any praise to right now. But you can also go to thecelticcoach.com. Until the next time, think big, have fun, and stay curious. This is the Celtic Coach. And that, my dear friends, is no blarney. Cheers.